and I, I wanted to be here one other week, but I got sick. And I've got some things going on right now. I don't know if Patty has shared with you or not, but I've been diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer as of this month. And uh, this is my gift of giving back because I want to let you know that you can overcome anything in your life. And you can overcome this fear of public speaking as well. So that's why I'm here to talk to you today about this fear of public speaking. So let me start by asking a question. Who has this fear of public speaking? Let me sh show your hands if you have a fear of public speaking, okay? Just about everybody, just about everybody, okay. So how would you rate your level of fear on a scale of one low, 10 high? And I'll ask everybody that raised their hand. How would you rate your level of fear of public speaking on a level of one to 10? So we'll start with you. Where's your level? Probably seven. A seven. Okay. All right. Where's yours, Zach? Mm -hmm. Depends on the occasion, but probably like a five. Overall five? Yeah. I'll say 5.5. 5.5. .5. Okay. <laughs> All right. Back here. Eight. Eight? It's that high? Okay. David? Eight. Eight? Yeah. I'd say about a six, but it also depends on the occasion. Too. Like okay. Five, say. About a six. Okay. Randy? Five. A five? Okay. All right. Because you're already prepared for it. Right. <laughs> Elizabeth? About a five. Okay. All right. So what is it exactly that makes you afraid? What is it? I mean, tell me exactly what it is. Mom, what is it? All the eyes. Well, all the eyes on you. Oh, yeah. All the eyes on you. Okay. <laughs> what else? Subject matter. Subject matter? Okay. Uh, now, don't you get to select for the most part what if you if if we have a subject matter that we have not selected a lot of times interest level can kind of <laughs> okay yeah. okay all right very good very good okay interest level yeah what else what's exactly the fear the odds I don't have this anymore but fear of being judged fear of being judged yeah. fear of being judged exactly so that's what I'm going to talk to you about is how to or how I overcame those eyes on me being judged, the subject matter that I might not be an expert in. Those are all the things that I'm going to talk about for about a half an hour tonight. This fear of public speaking. And here's how I'm going to do that: is I'm going to share my story, my personal story. That'll be the first thing that I do about this fear of public speaking. Then I'm going to share with you a formula on how you can actually use this formula to overcome your fear of public speaking or any other emotional breakdown that you might have. So this is a, a proven strategy that I have used in coaching and Patty actually has the, the, the form, what I call the truth talk form, that she will pass out at the end tonight that you can take with you and she can email it to you if you want an electronic version of that. Because I'm going to share with you tonight how I used this truth talk form or this formula for overcoming my fear. I'm going to use this as the example tonight. All right. Third thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about how I developed my authentic self and this mantra that has guided me for my 55 years. Then I'm going to talk about the three things that I learned about this fear of public speaking that could help you in overcoming that same fear. Then I'm going to introduce a caricature. Elizabeth, I don't know if you remember this caricature or not, but it might, it might pop up when I get to that part of the speech. You're going to go, oh, I remember when Tracy talked about that. You want to introduce a caricature. And then I'm going to give you four real world tips to help you in your public speaking, especially with the fact that you're here in a speech class, to help you in that regard. And then, as Patty said, I'm going to walk, I'm going to open it up to table topics where you ask me questions and I'll have one minute to respond. Okay? Does that make sense? Yes. All ready to go? Yeah. All right, very good. Hello? Sherry, hi, this is, this is Tracy Austin. If you remember, about three months ago, I committed to doing a coaching presentation for you, and 
you know, it's coming up that time that I'm, I'm, I'm supposed to do it. But Sherry, I don't want to do it. I'm too afraid. I'm too afraid. Can you, can you find somebody else to do it for me? Or can I find somebody else to do it for me? Because I'm just too afraid to do that presentation that I committed to you on October the 30th. That was a conversation that I had with my friend, Sharon McCurriero, here on the right, the Director of Public Relations. I was calling to bail out of my commitment that I had made to her three months earlier to do a coaching presentation at a local organization. See, I had signed up for the Speakers Bureau here at Franklin University. And because I had joined Toastmasters in 2008, and I was in there for about a year, it's like, okay, I'm going to be a public speaker. I'm going to be in the Speakers Bureau. And I put my name in the hat, and Sherry called me and said, hey, Trace, I've got a gig for you. But yet, I was trying to bail on my commitment to the Speakers Bureau and to Sherry because I was too afraid. All those eyes on me not being an expert, being judged, all of that was coming into play. See, I was supposed to do a presentation at, you guys familiar with this organization? DSCC, there on East Broad Street. I had committed to doing that presentation on October the 30th of 2008 in front of 70 people from 10 to 11 to their leadership development team. 70 people looking at me to talk about coaching. I was intimidated and I was ready to back out. When I had that conversation with Sherry on the phone, she said, Tracy, chill out. Here's what I'll do. I'll drive you to the event <laughs> if it'll make you feel more comfortable. Because I've seen you do a coaching presentation before, and you're really good at it. Come on, just go with me, and you'll be fine. It's like, okay, Sherry, only if you drive me there will I go. So if I fast forward my relationship with, with, with Sherry McCurio, though, now I refer to her as Mama Bird, because she took me to the nest and she let me fly because that was really the first time that I had done a presentation of that magnitude in front of 70 people. And she calls me Baby Bird. So every time we see each other, that's how we talk to one another. See, this wasn't my first encounter with this fear of public speaking. Early on in my career, when I was leading the academic advising team here at Franklin University, we were inviting another organization, another college or university, I think it was Rhodes State Community College, to come to Franklin University, and I was going to talk to them about what we had dubbed at the time our relationship management principles. And we had created um, teams of these, uh, around these guiding principles, and how we had used those for a couple of years at Franklin, and we were helping this organization understand how we use those and I was being the spokesperson for the academic advisors, and I had been on the original committee. But I was afraid to talk to those folks, those advisors from, from, from uh, Rhodes State Community College. So here's what happened. So I leave my house in Powell, Ohio. I'm, I'm going down Smoky Road, turning left on Hard Road. Then I turn right, going down 315. You go under the 161 exit, go under the, the Bethel exit, I go by the Ackerman exit, and I get down close to Ohio State. And I remember driving, I remember saying to myself, you know what? If I just drive my car in that embankment, I don't have to get my presentation. <laughs> That's how terrified I was of giving a presentation in front of other academic advisors about materials that I already knew. I was this close to crashing my car, so I didn't have to talk. That's how bad it had been for me during that time. But what I learned on that journey to October 30th of 2008 is to feel the fear 
and do it anyway. This book right here is the first resource or the first tool that helped me overcome my fear of public speaking. And you can see this thing is torn and tattered and written in because I read that book probably 15 times to help me overcome that fear of public speaking. So if you ever want a tool to help you, this is one tool that can help you do that by Dr. Susan Jeffers, who had just passed away last year, as a matter of fact. Feel the fear and do it anyway. And you know what the bottom line in that book is? The bottom line in that book is, you can handle it! Whatever it is, you can handle it! Whether it's giving a speech, up here like I'm doing right now, or you're doing your first speech or your second speech, you can handle it. It is literally not going to kill you. <laughs> like you think it is with someone that has an eight. <laughs> it is not going to kill you because you can handle it. Just like this world says, I'm handling it. So as I process, as I go through this journey and I'm processing this fear and how to handle it, what I always used to do were I forget everything and run. That was my equivalent of fear. I wanted to crash my car. I wanted to bail out on my presentation. Just forget everything and run. But as what noted author Wayne Dyer, who has passed as well, says it's false evidence appearing real. False evidence appearing real. So now I want to transition to how I overcame this fear of public speaking. So I've talked about the book that I read I, and how I process fear as far as false evidence appearing real. So now I want to talk to you, or tell you a story about uh, when I was going to do that presentation at DSCC, and I was freaking out about that. All right, so I'd already had that conversation with Sherry, but I was still freaking about freaking out about doing that presentation. It got so bad that it was about a month before I was supposed to do my presentation on October 30th of 2008. It got so bad that one whole week. I woke up at 2 o'clock in the morning and couldn't get back to sleep because I was freaking out about what was I going to talk about exactly, the material, what was I going to talk about in front of 70 people with all those eyes on me. How was I going to do this? How was I going to pull this off? So I remember calling my boss at the time on a Friday morning, called Evelyn Lavina. I said, Evelyn, I am freaking out. I have not slept all week. I need to take a day off today to get myself under control because you know I've got this presentation coming up. She said, Trace, go ahead and take the day off, but you've got to get yourself under control to be able to do this presentation. And you'll be fine doing the presentation. So she gave me a lot of encouragement. So I was able to take the day off. So I took the day off, and I started to think about what are some of the things that I should talk about at this presentation at DSCC? Because they were talking about for their leadership development group, and they, they said something about coaching. But they didn't really say exactly what coaching, you know, as far as what they wanted. But it was really up to me on what I wanted to deliver. So I decided, okay, the only way I'm going to be able to, to, to get through this is I'm going to use this truth talk form and these series of questions because I was already going through coach training. It's like, well, I might as well coach myself and see if this damn form actually works. So that's what I did. I took the form and all my coaching materials to Barnes & Noble and Karen was working at Barnes & Noble at the time. I remember sitting down at the, at the coffee table and I started going through this process of answering all of these questions on this document. And I still have this document. I still have it. Dated September 26th of 2008. Because it was such a transformative moment, I figured, 
I'm going to keep this thing because I think it's really going to help me down the line. And it has. So what I'm going to walk you through is the second resource of how you can use this form that, that Patty will give out to you, how you can use this form and how I use this form to help me overcome this fear of public speaking. And how to deal with what I call my inner negative voice. That inner negative voice where you're being judged, all the eyes on you, and you're thinking all the negative things that, that you think are real, right? So, so that's what I'm gonna walk you through now, right? So the first thing that they asked you to do on this and what I wrote down was, what's the catalyst for their action? So what happened exactly? Just the facts made from the old Dragnet show. Anybody remember the old Dragnet show other than me and Patty and Karen? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't think so. I need to change, I need to update this to something that people will know. Um, I'm showing my age here, and I am 55, and I'm very happy that I'm 55. So I've got to come up with a millennial way of doing just the facts here. So here are the facts. I was going to talk to 70 people at DSCC on October 30th, 2008. The hours are from 10 to 11. It's for, for their leadership development group at DSCC. And it says uh, something about uh, coaching in organizations as the sub. Those are the facts. The next question that I wrote my answers down to are my self-talk response. Can I just have somebody else do it, which is what I was calling Sherry to do, like Homer would do. Um, so what, what my self-talk response was, what did I say to myself about this fear? And here are all the things that I wrote down. I can't do it. I'm not experienced in coaching uh, in organizations. I'm not experienced enough overall. I need to bail out and call Sherry right away. I need to ask my mentor and my coaches to do it for me so I didn't have to do it. Ah, they won't get anything out of this. It won't apply to them. This is keeping me up at night. I'm afraid, I'm anxious, I'm nervous, I'm scared. All of those inner negative voices are coming up for me. I've tried, I, I have to find something of interest to them. Do I have enough time? And I had a month. And I'm still saying, do I have enough time to pull it together? I'm not able to walk or work out because all I want to do is sleep because I was in a state of depression. So those are all the things that I wrote down about my self-talk response. Moving on to the next question, how did I feel about it? How did I feel about it? I felt fear, real deep fear to do this presentation. I'm scared, I have all of this self-doubt, I'm nervous, I'm stressed as hell, I can't sleep, I have no confidence, and Karen says I'm annoying as hell. <laughs> 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 and then moving on to my behavioral response. So what was my behavioral response? And how did I respond to this fear? What did I do in response? Well, I decided I wanted to talk to Karen about this. But I'm under stress. I have to talk to people to get it out. So I wanted to talk to my, 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 my mentor, Dr. Ray Ford. I wanted to talk to uh, my, uh, my coach, Janine Moon, my coach, Lydia Gilmore. I wanted to talk to my counselor, because I was going through therapy at, time, at the time as well. I wanted to get ideas on how to proceed. I, I needed to look at the positive feedback of what I can do. So I started looking at some of the things that I'd done in the past, trying to get some feedback. I was trying to look for validation from other things that I'd done before so I could get pumped up because I was lacking such confidence. And I decided, you know what? I'm going to call my contact at DSCC and find out exactly what they want. What a good well, novel approach, right? Just ask them what they want. So I, called, uh, so I, I decided to call her. And then I also decided to look at the coach training that I was going through at the time 
to go through that all that training manual and see if I could extract some things from there that would help me deliver that presentation at DSCC. So I was really starting to understand that there were a lot of things that I could use to help myself. So those were the behavioral responses. And then what, what, I, what I realized, what I started to realize after going through this and writing this all, all, all this down was, is what I'm saying to myself true? I said, no, it's one hour. It's a coaching presentation that I, I have a passion for coaching and I've been doing coaching things at ye for years at Franklin. That I, I, I had this shift, that I can do this, that they will get something out of this, that I am good at this, that they're going to learn something that they didn't know before, and that I've done these with positive results. I've done a coaching presentation for financial aid, the enrollment advisors, the call center, the welcome center, and I've done it all this with other classes. And I've gotten positive feedback every time. I ever did any of these coaching presentations. So again, this shift started to happen. And one of those shifts was something I, I found in this book, and there was a phrase that really helped me with this shift. And I've shared this even in, you may remember this or not, Elizabeth in class before. So here's the quote that really helped me shift. There is no failure, only feedback. There are no mistakes, only lessons learned. So think about that. Think about just viewing life as feedback and lessons learned. How does that make things different for you when you look at it just as feedback and lessons learned? This is the engagement part. Puts a positive spin on it instead of a negative. Puts a positive spin on it. And who doesn't need a little positive spin to get up here and do these kinds of things. It's simply feedback. So if I get feedback, well, I'm not gonna do, I'm not gonna do that again. I'm not gonna have 48 ands in my speech. And the onus is on me not to do that. So that quote really helped me shift. Feedback and lessons learned. So starting to look at those positive results that have happened in the past. We want to fast forward and how this shift took place. So fast forwarding here to this positive feedback and these lessons learned, this is a coaching presentation that I did in 2015. And I have always said that it was probably the best coach training I've ever completed because I always got feedback every year that I did that coaching presentation. It got better and better and better. And this is an example of that. And enough and more evidence of that is the evaluation that these 14 people provided at the end of that session. At the end of that session of those 14 people, 14 rated the program as excellent, 13 as excellent. There's this one outlier, damn it, 93% for that. How well did the session meet your expectations? Talking about them, 100%. Overall value of the program, 100%. And instructor's presentation skills. So through all of that work I had done for all of those years, here's the real evidence of what's possible. Moving from a guy that wanted to bail out of his coaching commitment or wreck his car to this evidence right here. So the last, one of the last strategies are, are my <coughs> responses helping, or, helping me or hurting me. Originally, my responses were hurting me. They were holding me back. And you saw that trans that transformation that I was able to make by using this truth talk form. So, as there's my filler word is so today, and, and it is for 
for a lot of the things that I do, but I acknowledge it. And it won't happen the rest of the night. So get over it, no. <laughs> so after working through this formula, writing down my answers to the questions, I saw my responses were hurting me. My responses were hurting me. My negative thinking started to shift from fear to imagining the possibilities that might even be that they might be able to take some of these coaching principles that I am going to show to them in one hour. Started to shift. So this shift took me into this new perception that you can see me transforming into. And that new perception, I actually have it written down here of what I ended up writing. My new perception is in one hour, I will show them how they can use coaching questions and coaching techniques to include in their leadership development program. And if just one person can walk away from that, getting some information to help them, then my job is complete. My job is complete. That's what my new perception became. I want to transition, I want to transition uh, uh, forward again. This is uh, a presentation that I did this year, so this fast forward eight years later, this is where I talk about my authentic self, how this all came about. So before I get into the details of this, so my authentic self has come out. I have developed a real good sense of who I am. And that starts with I know my core values. My core values, and I've, I've written about this and I've talked about this a lot, my core values is I'll always live my life with passion. I'll always live my life with a positive attitude. Even in spite of pancreatic cancer, I choose to have a positive attitude. And I choose to surround myself in positive relationships. Those are my three core values. Second thing as part of my authentic self is developing a mantra, a quote that I use to keep me centered all the time. It's a quote by Charles Swindoll, and it's, the essence of it is, I'm convinced that life is 10% what happens to me, and 90% how I react to it. Charles Swindoll. And I keep that with me all the time. My quote about having a positive attitude. Every day, every moment. It's a choice. It's a choice. I usually have about 50 of these and I give out to people. I only have five left now, so uh, I'll get some more made up and then I'll give it to Patty and that will be my gift to all of you, okay? All right, now the other thing as far as my authentic self, Karen and I are, we're, we're just talking to Patty about a leadership and emotional intelligence lead, uh, program that we are a part of called Next Level Columbus. And one of those things that we learned about in Next Level Columbus is to come up with a contract. My contract coming through all of that Next Level training is I am a powerful, inspiring, giving leader. And I live my contract every day. Karen, what is your contract? I am a powerful, vulnerable, inspirational leader. Live, yes, you are. Thank you. Living it every day. It's a choice. My authentic self and my mantra. That's who I am now, up here with all eyes on me. Being judged, it's okay. Because I know who I am. All right. So, again, I want to fast forward how I have learned to overcome this fear of public speaking because. All of the, I did a workshop for the Ross College of Business here at Franklin University. All these people here are PhDs. And they asked me to come facilitate a two hour training for them in regard to setting their mission, their goals, and objectives for the upcoming year. PhDs. I'm scared, you know what, right? But 
the result of that two hours, and I think this is one of the best, I know I want to say that before in my last coaching training, but I think this was the best for me. This was the best facilitation I've ever done in my life. Because I put my all my heart and soul into that presentation for those two hours because I'm a powerful, inspirational, giving leader. Right? So I want to read to you Dr. Joanna Williamson, who is the chair of Marketing and Communication, I believe. Dr. Dr. Williamson wrote this note to me when I was finished doing that presentation. She said, we asked Tracy Austin to be the facilitator of our academic college retreat because we were very familiar with his enthusiasm and professionalism. He was the key, he was the person we knew as totally embracing his role for the university while he was employed there as a coach and a trainer. He would go so far as to walk around campus wearing a name tag every day with a word or short phrase communicating a positive affirmation that would impact how he felt even after just a 30 second encounter with him. Last paragraph. What we experienced with Tracy at our retreat though was far beyond what we anticipated. We expected that he would be able to help us translate our business swapped strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats into an action plan moving forward. What we didn't expect is the unique dynamic way that he poured himself into our session to totally humanize the experience in a manner that left each of us filled with hope, motivation, and personal empowerment. As one of our retreat attendees said at the end of the day, if we are able to accomplish what Tracy inspired us to believe we can do, how could we not look forward to coming to work every day? That's how I've overcome this fear of public speaking. It's through a lot of the work that I've shown you here tonight. So I want to, in essence, recap a couple things that I learned over these years about overcoming this fear of public speaking. One, use your resources. Feel the Fear, Do It Anyway is a great book to help you do that. The other thing is what I call the Truth Talk form. It's the form that Patty has. So all of those things that I answered those questions to, this is a way to help you overcome any of those emotional blocks that you have. And the other thing that we've been talking about all night is Toastmasters. <laughs> I always thought that Toastmasters was the single most important thing that I've done to help me develop to who I am personally and professionally. It is one of those things. Toastmasters is one of those things. It's a great investment. Another investment is the next level of trainings that, that uh, we have talked about as well. But Toastmasters gave me the platform to practice all this stuff and get used to the eyes on me and get used to the subject matter, get used to being judged, all right? The other thing I want to help you understand is, and what I learned is, when I did that presentation at DSCC, there was 70 people to attend. There were 11 that showed up. <laughs> 11 showed up. So I made, literally made a mountain out of a molehill. <laughs> 70 to 11. Which made me feel good because it was an intimate group like this. So rather than having 140 eyeballs on me, I had a 22, thank you. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, I'm numbers neutral, so thank you. All right, then let me introduce you to Yang. This is my internal negative voice. This is my gremlin voice. His name is Yang because it stands for you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. You're not black enough. You're not hip enough. You're not young enough. You're not, you're not urban enough. You're not, this is everything for me. I'm not good enough. You fill in the blank. That's what he said all of my life. I'm not good enough. And what I'm here to tell you is Yang, and you can name your inner negative voice whatever you like, Yang is not telling you the truth. He's not telling you the truth. 
And when I call him out, his power diminishes. And when I do coaching around internal native voice, gremlin voice, I've had people name theirs Griselda, because that worked for her. And she knows when Griselda is showing up, what Griselda is trying to keep her comfortable and safe in her own little bubble, not do anything outside her comfort zone. Everything the opposite of feel the fear and do it anyway. Another one called it Irwin. Irwin, because the, the ideal is, or I can win. Or I can win. So you can name your voice whatever you would like. And, and I'd be curious here. If you had to name your inner negative voice like I've named my name, what might you name your voice? And this is the interactive part here. What might you name your gremlin voice? Anybody care to share what you think it might be? I see you smiling, Jason. So <laughs> I, I'd just be very interested. Could you name it? What do you think you might name yours? <laughs> I have no idea. Okay? Anybody? Karen? You know what I call mine. Shut up, monkey. <laughs> shut up, monkey. Because I think of it as like this little monkey that jumps around in my brain. So I go, shut up, monkey. Shut up, monkey. I even have a monkey that I have hanging on the lamp in my office, and I have a noose around his neck. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody think of what they might name theirs? Something negative? Okay. Yeah. I'm not sure. I was, thinking, uh, I was thinking Smeagol from Lord of the Rings. Of course, I mean, Say again? Smeagol from Lord of the Rings. Smeagol from Lord of the Rings. I'm not familiar. With. Yeah, that could be something. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And just when you think you've got it under control, he shows up some other way. He shows up some other way. So just to let you know that. And I always thought when I would when I would talk about Yang, I'd kick him around or throw him around. But I want to do that. I want to keep him close because I want to keep him close to me because I, I want to get an idea of what he's up to because I know he's up to something. Once I'm bearing or pushing, pushing around or fight with him, I can't fight with him. I need to know what the hell he's trying to do to me to keep me safe. Because that's what he's trying to do, is keep me safe and not grow and develop. So there are books about taming your gremlin. This is the book by Rick Carson, and there are webs there's a website for this also. And they actually have you uh, draw your gremlin so you can name your gremlin voice. So it's very therapeutic to be able to name. Patty, would you name, if you had one, what would you name your voice? <laughs> All right. All right. Now I'm going to talk about, get ready to wrap up with four real world tips for for success in public speaking, especially for the speech class. Number one is practice. Just practice. In Toastmasters, we say when we give a speech, one of our um, longtime members who really gets paid a lot of money for public speaking is Anthony Iannarino, and he said you should practice your speech 25 times if you're in Toastmasters. 25 times. But think of how good you would be if you practice it that long. The second one is just be yourself. Be your, thin, be your authentic self. So when I, when I um, thought about being up here tonight and my gremlin voice, what my gremlin voice is saying to me, what my gremlin voice is saying to me right now, and, and I'm being authentic about this, is wow, he didn't even shave before he came to the class tonight. <laughs> That's what my gremlin voice said. It's like, so? I didn't shave. <laughs> What's the big deal? But that's what my gremlin voice was saying to me. You didn't shave. You didn't shave. Third thing, tell a story. We all remember stories. Little Red Riding Hood, Three Little Pigs. Tell a story. People remember stories. We're re we're connect we are wired for connection with stories. So always share stories. And then lastly, evaluate yourself. So it's a good thing that you guys have a camera, that you actually have an evaluation that you can provide for me to give me feedback and lessons learned. So those are four real world tips 
that I would say to you in your speech class that you can do very easily. And the other thing I'd like to share with you is because I've been able to overcome this fear of public speaking, that I've been asked and had paid speaking engagements in New Orleans, San Antonio. I've been asked to present at companies like The Gap, OCLC, Alliance Data, and Sinclair Community College because of this journey of overcoming this fear of public speaking. And the ideal for me now is not about the fear, it's not about the money. For me, it's about stepping into my power. I'm a powerful, inspirational, giving leader. That's what life is about for me now. That's what well, our lives have developed into giving back by sharing our own real stories. Our own real stories. So you have an opportunity in your Speech 100 class to feel the fear and do it anyway because you can handle it. Thank you. Now I am going to open it up for table topics. Right, Pat? Do you want to